All right, um, why don't we get started? <clears throat> so we have a project uh, that was posted last night or this morning, depending on your perspective, and it is project number two concerning HTTP, which will be primarily the subject of today. Uh, please make sure um, you look at it uh, right away, not necessarily now, but certainly today uh, would be a good uh, day uh, to look at it. It's due in one week, which is the 11th of February, yeah, 11th at the usual one second uh, before midnight. Okay, uh, where we left off last time, we talked about um, the web as being a set of documents, and these documents are scattered about the network, and the access to these documents are um, arbited uh, by uh, a server. And so in uh, HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, it's certainly a client-server architecture where the client is your web browser and the server is the web server. And when your client sends a request to the web server, it's doing a lot of things underneath the covers for you uh, for the sake of convenience, and that's more of a user interface design thing. But as far as the raw protocol is concerned, it's sending requests, your client, your browser. And these requests um, are a certain set of commands, and one of the commands is to retrieve or to get a particular web page. Now, a web page consists of a bunch of objects. It's a semi-structured document, and you might have some text. Uh, you have sections of the document. You might have some fields, things like buttons and drop-down lists and all that good stuff. And the inside of this document are references or hyperlinks uh, to either other documents or to other objects like files, videos, and so forth. And so when you um, specify a web address, it comes into in a bunch of parts. One is the host name, uh, something like www.desu.edu. Uh, that is a text description of what ultimately uh, gets translated uh, to an IP address, right? Like 192.168.3.14. Now, of course, uh, that text means something to us because it's easier for us as humans uh, to remember a name for something uh, than a number. Uh, but all your browser really cares about is the IP address. And in fact, you can substitute uh, in your browser uh, command window, or rather the uh, URL field, you can specify an IP address. It doesn't have to be uh, a domain name uh, in, uh, to, to, to work. And then that machine is ultimately the server that gets contacted and what your uh, web browser is asking, or one of the things it can ask, is to get a particular file. Well, one, one piece of information that server needs to know is, well, where should I get this file, and what is the name of the file? So in addition to an encoding of the machine's name, its identity, you also have some path, and that's going to be a directory that ultimately is underneath some location, some starting location on the file system on your machine managed by your web browser. Uh, and then ultimately um, you have the name of the file itself or resource. It could be an HTML file, it could be a PHP file, it could be a cascaded style sheet, it could be a GIF, an animated GIF, a video, or what have you. Okay, So all of that is our um, uni universal resource locator or URL, and that's how you describe objects uh, collectively that uh, comprise a web page. Now certainly once this content is uh, sent back to the browser uh, by the server. The browser, browser then takes all of this, it parses it or chops up uh, that HTML and accepts all those resources, and it follows the commands uh, that are encoded or specified uh, by the HTML. So if it says draw a red background, it draws a red background. If it says draw this picture and here's the bits of the picture, it draws the bits of those picture in the location specified uh, in the size and shape uh, that has been specified. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? So that's where we left off. Uh, so let's continue on and take a look at the semantics of the interaction uh, between uh, the browser uh, and the web server. Now, I remember when HTTP uh, or the World Wide Web, the graphical web, was still fairly new in the mid-90s. And the neat part about it was that any browser can work with any server. And what that meant is as different form factors for computers came online, uh, like mobile devices and things like that, uh, you would encode that same application uh, regardless of what client uh, was running. 
Now, that was very different from the earlier days in software. In the earlier days in software, you'd have to go out and buy the software and install it the same way you used to be, have to install things like Microsoft Office, right? Uh, but the problem with that from a maintenance standpoint is that now if you wanted to implement a new feature, you had to convince everybody who's installed your software to go ahead and purchase the update or acquire the update. And that's a huge maintenance overhead. With a server-based or web-based application, the beautiful part about it is that you just change the definition of that application page on the website. And now every time somebody goes to that website again, they now get that automatic update. So it's a lot easier uh, to deploy software updates uh, when it's web-based. And so the web's application layer protocol, Hypertext Transport Protocol or HT Transfer Protocol or HTTP uh, is a client server architecture. Your web browser serves the role of the client and the web server certainly serves the role of the server. Now, modern web servers do a lot more than just give you uh, web pages. A lot of them uh, c connect to backend databases, all sorts of other resources, and as such, a whole cottage industry of web-based application uh, frameworks and infrastructure uh, has uh, popped up over the past uh, two decades or so. Now, certainly what your um, web-based API does, this infrastructure, it assumes you have certain components on board on your website and on your web browser, both in terms of the scripting languages, as well as executable content, or the way you specify processing pipelines uh, uh, to give you certain uh, capabilities, right? So when you look at a web framework, you have the Spring Web Framework, or you have, you know, name X, Y, and Z Web Framework, it's just an assumption of the set of technologies that exist server side as well as client side so that you can implement certain types of behaviors uh, in your interactions in your web applications, your interactions between your client and your server. So at its base level, HTTP uh, is organized as a client server model. And again, as we said before, the client is that entity uh, sitting on a host that initiates the contact and it sends a request to a server that's waiting for incoming requests. The server gets this incoming request, it deciphers or parses that request, it performs some work and takes the result and delivers it back across the wire uh, to the client. And so the client initiates this uh, request and you might have uh, maybe a desktop computer running uh, the open source Firefox uh, browser. You initiate a request to some server. The server is running something like Apache. Now Apache is an open source uh, web server. It's the predominant web server platform out there. Now Microsoft has their web server and their other web server implementations out there, but Apache seems to be uh, the dominant market share leader as far as web server technologies is concerned. Um, so you initiate a request. Um, the web server, something like Apache, uh, looks to its hard drive, uh, gets the right file or resource, and brings it into memory and sends it back out across the link uh, as a response back to this browser. Now, as I said before, you get the same or similar experience if you're on a different type of client. Equally as much, you could have maybe an iPhone and your iPhone is running the mobile version of Safari. And when you have these mobile versions of web servers, it does what they used to call web clipping, right? You're changing the look and feel to fit the fact uh, that you have this smaller screen because you can't display things the same way on a small screen the size of your palm versus something that is maybe a 27 inch monitor. So you have maybe an iPhone running Safari. It is an HTTP client, it's a browser, and it sends its request to the web server and you get back a response. That response comes back and based on the settings of the browser and other information that I will talk about in the next few slides, this browser on your mobile device reorganizes the screen so that it looks appropriate for that small form factor. And so this web server sends web pages, but it also sends other objects. And your web page, you can think of as a collection of objects that get delivered um, by this web server upon request uh, by your web client or your browser. Okay? Right. Any questions about this? Um, all right. So, HTTP uses transport layer services from TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. And as we said before, well, um, TCP is the so-called reliable transport service. And if you think about what happens when you're sending text across the wire, or you're sending pictures, objects, any kind of rich media that you might think of as something that would come in a web page, 
Well, the order matters. You can't have the bits getting rearranged because the text no longer is meaningful and the picture is no longer meaningful. In addition, everything you send must be delivered, right? It can't get corrupted and it also has to arrive in the order you sent it and you can't lose information or else the meaning changes. And so for that reason, HTTP makes use of TCP as the underlying transport layer uh, for that particular protocol. And so the client initiates a connection in TCP. Uh, in order to get this reliability, you have to set up a connection. And what does setting up that connection means? It means that the client underneath the covers contacts the server and says, hey, server, um, I'm a client and I'd like to engage in this particular protocol with you, this interchange of messages. Do you have the resources available in order to do that? Now, either the server answers yes or it answers no. If it answers no, then it cannot satisfy this request. If it answers yes, then it instantiates these resources and we'll talk about in great detail what these resources are, but nonetheless, the server instantiates the resources it needs in order to get engaged in its responsibility uh, for this reliable transport um, between it and the client. So the server answers yes, and then the client says, okay, great. I got back that response, yes, you've allocated the resources, and now any subsequent interaction that I have, assuming this protocol, I know that you're able to respond appropriately to me. Okay, so the client initiates the TCP connection and programmatically, this is when you create the socket uh, software construct that I talked about. And using that socket, when you create it, all of that initialization happens for you. Now to the application, it believes that you instantiate one of these sockets and all of a sudden it can magically talk directly to this other process across the internet. But a lot of stuff as you'll find over the course of the semester happens in each of these layers five layers in the internet protocol stack um, that we alluded to um, a few modules ago. So the server accepts the incoming request and it then allocates um, the resources uh, on its own behalf that it needs in order to engage in communication. And then the client now sends messages, HTTP messages uh, to the server and these have meaning, right? So the server gets a message, it interprets it, it performs some work, it gets a response to performance of that work, it sends that response back across the wire in a predetermined format. Now this section, this part that says HTTP is stateless, that's really, really important because statelessness uh, gets your protocols to scale, right? And you think about typical, typical internet scale, you have millions of people accessing some web resource uh, at the same time, right? Uh, and so stateless means that the server does not maintain any particular connection-based information about you. So for example, let's say you have a streaming application and you have some video, maybe you're watching a movie on Netflix or something like that, and you know, you're know you at 35 minutes into the movie, right? Now in a stateful implementation, the server knows this is where you currently are in the movie. In a stateless implementation, in exchange between a client and server, the server has no idea where you left off. You at the client have to know where you left off so you can say, okay, get this particular block of data. Now, when you're stateless, because there's no information maintained on your behalf, you can scale a lot more because there's less information that needs to be written down. And so when you're stateless, it means that you're less susceptible to crashing, right? Uh, because if you have state that's maintained and something crashes, now you have to repair that state and that takes time and that takes resources. And so the idea of statelessness is what affords HTTP and web applications the ability to scale uh, to so-called internet scale, millions upon millions of people, okay? But there are some fix-ups that we'll find that's made with this to implement something that looks like statelessness, but there's no statelessness. Uh, this is called cookies, and we'll talk about that in a few slides as well. Okay, any questions about this? Does that make sense? No? All right. So there are two major flavors of HTTP connection, this connection between the client and the server. One is called persistent, and one is called non-persistent. Now this refers to um, how you transfer one instance of an object. An object can be an HTML file, excuse me, it can be an image, it can be a video, 
any singular resource that maps to a file on the file system somewhere on the server. Now, if non-persistent HTTP, what it means that for a single connection, you're going to transfer one object at a time. So you initiate a connection, you say retrieve this object, it gives you that object, the connection is closed, and then if you want to get another object or fetch another object, you have to open a new connection. The good news uh, for non-persistent HTTP is that you can download multiple objects at the same time by initiating more than one connection, each for one of those multiple objects. The bad news is, and you'll find this all over computer networking, there's good news and there's bad news, right? The bad news is, well, if you open multiple connections, uh, one for each of the objects you need, well, those connections take up resources. Recall, each connection that you make between the client and the server requires the server to allocate resources. And so if you have 10 objects, now you need 10 units of those resources on a server. A computer only has a finite amount of resources and therefore can support a maximum number of connections. And I don't know if you've ever gone to a website and it's giving you an error message that a connection refused, right? That means that it has reached the limit of the available connections uh, that it can hand out, right? Um, among other reasons. So what persistent HTTP does, it's a little bit different. With persistent HTTP, uh, that connection persists. So it leaves that connection open, and then every subsequent request for an object is made over that single connection. The good news about that is that it's much more scalable because for each set of interchanges of information, file system objects or resources between the client and the server, the cost you pay in terms of connection is only one single connection. Now, the drawback is that it's slower because you cannot, cannot do things in parallel. And so if you're implementing a web-based application, one of the decisions you need to make are what are my connection uh, semantics? Do I have persistent HTTP or non-persistent HTTP? It's not to say that one is better than the other. It's about understanding the implications of your design decisions. Right? So if bigger scalability is more important to you uh, than raw performance, bless you, um, then go with persistent HTTP for raw scalability. If performance is more important to you uh, or rate of transfer, uh, then um, bless you, everyone's sick. <laughs> Hopefully uh, you take care of yourselves because there's some serious uh, stuff going around in the U.S. Uh, but fortunately, the confirmed case of... Uh, coronavirus in Kent County was not substantiated. So at least for now, knock on wood, you can <laughs> rest assured uh, that we're good for now. All right, anyways, so if your concern is just performance, right, your web pages load faster, right, uh, or your media is delivered much faster, uh, and if that performance is more important to you uh, than scalability, then you'd want to go uh, with the non-persistent HTTP. So, you know, networking and things like operating systems, it's a lot different from other courses, like more mathematical types of courses, in that it's about understanding the implication of your design decisions for your particular application. So what's right for one application is not necessarily right for the other application. So with non-persistent HTTP, at most one object sent over a connection, and that connection is closed. So you can also download multiple objects by op opening multiple concurrent uh, connections. With persistent HTTP, multiple objects can be sent over a single connection between the client and the server. And the drawback for that, um, it is slower, but your scalability is higher. Okay. Any questions about this? All right. So, Let's take a look at the non-persistent case. Again, non-persistent means one connection per object. Here we have the client on the left-hand side, your left, and we have the server on the right-hand side. So suppose you enter some URL, uh, some EDU, and some uh, directory, and you're looking for the uh, index.html file, um, home. or home.index. Um, you initiate the connection, the client does, um, using TCP. And so it specifies the domain name, the textual name, and that will map to the IP address and port 80, which is the port number uh, for the web server, right? For the HTTP server. So that connection request is received uh, at the server uh, of interest. It checks its resources and answers back, yes, I have the resources uh, necessary to engage in reliable data transport. So it accepts the connection 
only once it guarantees that it has the resources and sends back this yes response. So the client gets this yes response and says, okay, great. I know that the server uh, is able to satisfy its responsibility in this reliable data transport. So then the client goes ahead and sends a subsequent message, and that's the actual request to fetch uh, some object uh, from the server or that's located on the server. So then in the next exchange of messages, the client in step two uh, sends its HTTP formatted request to the server. The server receives this request, it parses it, and it is a well-defined schema to it. And then it locates the resource, does some work, pulls it off of disk into memory, and then sends it through its socket uh, back across the wire uh, to the client application. So it does this, and then it closes the connection, right? And so this stuff is in flight, and then the connection closes. That means no new data will be coming from the server back to the client. So the client receives this response, and maybe this response contains an HTML file. It takes that HTML file, parses it, and it sees a bunch of references. In this example, these are references to 10 objects. Maybe they're uh, image files like JPEGs, right? So then subsequently, now that the client sees that this web page has a bunch of JPEGs, those JPEGs have URLs telling you the machine where these JPEGs are located, the directories on those machines, and the name of the JPEGs. So now this client takes each one of these URLs for the JPEGs, and it's not done yet drawing the web page. It needs to fetch these images in order to complete the drawing of this web page or the rendering to your screen. So then in non-persistent HTTP, each one of these steps, one through five, is repeated for each of the 10 JPEG uh, objects. So that would be the initiation of the connection request. It would be uh, the getting of this object, the receiving of the response, and then the drawing of it on the screen. Now, certainly this client could create these uh, 10 subsequent requests for these 10 JPEGs concurrently. It just creates all 10, and at the same time, each, 10, oh, each of these 10 JPEGs is being requested at the same town, uh, time, downloaded at the same time, et cetera. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? No? Okay. So one of the key aspects when you're trying to consider whether you should use persistent or non-persistent HTTP is the response time. Now, certainly you all have an intuitive sense of a sluggish web page versus a fast web page. Some web pages take longer to draw. Some web pages are faster in their drawing. Now, some of that has to do uh, with the transfer of these objects and also um, the distance, not in terms of physical distance, but distance in terms of network distance uh, between the client and the server. And so this round trip time is the measurement uh, or RTT of response time. And round trip time corresponds to the amount of time it takes for your message to get from the client to the server, both for the connection request, do you have the resources to engage in this communication, as well as the transfer of the objects themselves corresponding to the web page and all the rich media. And so here you'll find, and this is in the book, a typical network diagram. And in a network diagram, it describes um, the relationship between a client and a server or more correctly, two entities that communicate on the internet or across the network, uh, and what happens in time. So on the left-hand side, uh, we have the client. On the right-hand side, we have the server. And what is typical for these network protocol diagrams is that time increases going down. So whatever happens higher up happens before, and whatever happens lower down in these network diagrams happens afterwards. So here we have a message, and these messages in these network diagrams, protocol diagrams, are depicted as edges. And so the butt end of the arrow um, represents the initiator of the message, and the arrow head end of the arrow represents uh, the recipient of the message. So in this particular diagram, it talks about the initiation of the connection as well as the request and response uh, behavior between the client and the server. So we start out in the beginning, you have the client machine initiating this TCP connection. So it's requesting a connection from the server. So here, going down, that's the first thing that happens, and the client sends a message across the network to the server. 
Now, this is a logical diagram. You'll notice here, I'm not drawing any routers. I'm not you know, counting the hops and communicating the nodal delay and the transmission delay, propagation delay, and all that good stuff. This is just talking about the two endpoints from the perspective of the client and the server, what happens in terms of the messages received and the behaviors they engage in. So here we have the client initiates the TCP, the, the reliable transport connection request, and that message makes its way to the server. The server, between the time when it receives that message, that connection request, and sends its response back across the wire, um, it does some work. It checks its resources, it allocates them, does what it needs to do, and then when it answers yes or no, it sends that back across the wire in the reverse direction. Now, of course, that took time. The time that it took for the client to send its message and the time that it took for the server to ultimately uh, render its response. And that's called the round trip time, right? The time it takes that message to make its way to the destination and back again uh, to the source. And that's often called one RTT, one round trip time. So one round trip time is spent trying to initiate the connection request to guarantee that the endpoints communicating have established the resources needed to engage in some predetermined subsequent behavior. Okay, so then next you have the actual request itself. Once the client gets back the response from uh, the server as a result of the connection request, the client then uh, initiates its request to fetch some object from the server. So the client sends that across the wire and that's a specifically formatted uh, message and we'll talk about that format to retrieve some resource. So it takes time for that message to get there to the server. So now the server gets that message, it parses it, it does something in response to that message, retrieves that resource, and it sends the response back across the wire. Now certainly that response, if it's to get a web page, there's going to be a first bit of that web page, the first few uh, bits of that web page. Now those first few bits of the web page, those are going to get transmitted back across the wire uh, inside of the response that the server returns back to the client across the same connection. So the time it takes for that request to come from the client and the first few bits in the response to come back from the server, that's another round trip time, right? Because the request goes in and the first few bits of the request of the response come back. So that's another round trip time or another RTT. Then after that second RTT or round trip time, then you have the time it takes for the entire file to get transmitted. Because if you have a first bit, you're gonna have a last bit. And depending on the size of that object that you're transferring, it's gonna take a longer amount of time for that file to get transferred, that response to get transferred. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? So for non-persistent HTTP, we said at the outset that a separate connection is used for each object. So that means for a single object, whether it's an HTML file, a graphics file, a video, or what have you, it takes two round trip times, the first one to establish the connection, and the second one to process the request and get back the first few bits, plus the transmission time of the file. So the cost you pay for non-persistent HTTP for transferring of a single object is two round trip times plus the file transmission time. Does that make sense? So if you have a lot of objects in your web page, well, you're going to pay two RTT plus file transmit for every single one. So if it's 100 objects, it's going to be 100 times two RTT plus file transmit. If it's 10 objects, it's going to be 10 times two RTT plus file transmit. And so depending on your application, this is going to seriously affect what your clients view as being the web page load time, right? Any questions about this? that makes sense? Okay, so this response time for non-persistent uh, HTTP um, is very, very damning if you choose poorly for your particular application. So when we compare non-persistent HTTP with persistent HTTP, well, as we just said, non-persistent HTTP uses two RTTs per object. And so you have this overhead that adds up over time if you're transmitting a lot of objects in order to display a web page in some application. And so in order to try to speed this up, many browsers often open up more than one HTTP connection. 
So maybe you have uh, 10 objects in your web page, and maybe it'll open up 10 connections and download them concurrently in effort to try to speed up what ultimately is the web page load time. Okay, any questions about this? And then subsequently, uh, or in addition, for persistent HTTP, because the server leaves the connection open, you only pay that to RTT to establish the connection and do the initial get. You only pay that cost once, right? And then once the objects are known, you're doing the get, 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 and getting the response back from the server over the same connection. So if you have a lot of objects, you only pay that to RTT once, uh, but the objects come sequentially down that same connection. And for some applications, uh, that's a better set of semantics for transferring objects. Okay. Any questions? No. And again, I'd like to stress, if someone were to ask you which one is better, well, it depends on the application. Okay? All right. So, the two types of messages, the request messages and the response message, and HTTP messages are in ASCII text. Why are they in ASCII text? Because it's easy to debug. Now, the bad news is, of course, if it's in ASCII text, well, somebody using Wireshark can intercept this, which is why it's good to have encrypted communication. So this is the structure, literally, of an HTTP GET request. This is the client asking the server to retrieve some object from its local file system. So we have three parts in an HTTP client message, a request message. We have what's called the request line. Now the request line is this first line in the protocol, uh, and this encodes what behaviors or what the client is asking the server to do. Now get means it wants the server to retrieve something. Uh, post means it wants to send the server something. And head means that it's not interested in the object itself, it just wants to know the meta information. And we'll talk about meta information. So we have the request line um, encoding what the client is asking of the server. And you'll notice here we have a command, get, and then we have the file itself. Now this doesn't have a directory in front of it, but it could. And then we also have the version of HTTP. Now that version of HTTP is really important because from HTTP uh, 1.0 to 1.1 and other versions, um, the repertoire of behaviors that a server supports is changed, it's increased, okay? Uh, then we also have a way of delimiting or terminating that particular line. And in the case of HTTP, it's carriage return line feed. Now, back in the early days of Unix, uh, you had carriage return line feed, and that uh, goes back to um, teletypes, right? When you didn't have monitors, you had uh, these printers that were really fast and would print out what the response was line by line uh, from the computer. And carriage return would take the print head and return it back to the left-hand side uh, of, the, of the printing element, uh, and line feed would advance the paper one space, and that sort of stuck, that terminology, uh, when things went from uh, teletypes uh, to monitors, display monitors. So we have the request line, and then we have the end or termination of that request, and in the middle, we have so-called header lines. Now these header lines encode what you might call the meta information. It's descriptors about the particular interaction. And so one of them, the header lines, they're all organized with uh, some ASCII text with a colon and some other ASCII text. And the uh, text to the left of the colon is a so-called name, and the text to the right of the colon is a so-called value. So you can imagine these are variables that they're setting. The host variable is set to www.net.cs.umass.edu. The user agent, which is another name for the browser type, is set to Firefox 3.6 version. The accept language is US English, right? Now, the reason why people care about the header information, sometimes if you direct your browser to a website uh, in an international uh, region or internationally, or maybe some region uh, where there's a large percentage of different spoken languages, uh, it'll automatically display the French version or the English version, for example, or the German version or the English version. And how that's done is that the browser, well, it knows the accept language for the browser is maybe French, right? The web server gets it, and if it sees the accept language is French, it'll give you the content from the French version of the website versus the English version of the website. And so these header lines are used 
uh, for all sorts of reasons, including cookies that we'll talk about. Now, it just happens one of the header line entries, connection keep alive, right? That's a persistent connection. And here uh, is the amount of time. I can't remember if it's seconds or milliseconds, uh, but this is the idle timer value. It'll keep that connection alive if there's no activity between the client and the server for a certain amount of time. Question? That's the termination for the for the message itself. And so that terminates uh, the front portion, and then you can optionally have uh, the actual uh, bits of the object, but most websites don't support posting these days. So to answer your question, uh, backslash r, backslash n, backslash r is carriage return, and backslash n is line feed, and that's how you terminate lines uh, in HTTP. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so we have three parts of the message. We have the request line, we have the header lines, and then we have the termination of this message. You can optionally have additional information uh, for object if you want the client to send information to the server. Okay, so this is a schematic of what the arrangement or organization is for an HTTP message. And this is the format for any HTTP message that's going from the client, a request message, to the server. So we have the method, like get or post, it's what the uh, client is requesting the server do. Then you have a space, just a regular space bar, you know, if you will. Then you have the URL, and that can have directories uh, in addition to the file system object. Then you have a space in the version, HTTP 1.0 or HTTP 1.1, uh, so forth. And then you have carriage return, which is backslash R, and line feed, which is backslash N. So you notice here, each line uh, in the HTTP request message is terminated or delineated by a carriage return line feed. So you have a carriage return line feed on the end of this line, on the end of that line, and then that line, end of that line, and so forth. And so here we have the header name. It's the header name, right? You have a space uh, and you have a value and it's terminated by carriage return line feed. Now, if you look up HTTP protocols, uh, you'll see a vocabulary, if you will, of all the different header, header, header line values, name value pairs uh, that you can have uh, for the header lines uh, section of the protocol. So then the header portion is delimited, del delimited by carriage return line feed, and then you have the entity body, right? The entity body would be if you want the client uh, to tell the server to upload this particular object, uh, that's where the bits of the object would sit in the protocol. Okay, any questions about this? Does that make sense? And so certainly in Wireshark, uh, you see uh, these messages, and on the previous slide, that's literally uh, what an HTTP GET request uh, looks like. Okay, so that's the GET request. Uh, let's take a look at uploading. Now, the POST method um, is how you would upload uh, a, a file system object from the client uh, to the server, but that's almost never used, and it's never, almost never used because it's a very dangerous thing to do, right? Because you're essentially, you the server, accepting files from a client. Now, just because someone says they're uploading a JPEG, it doesn't mean they are uploading a JPEG. It could be an executable of some sort, right? And if they're able to exploit some flaw in a piece of software, they could end up installing something on your machine and taking control of, uh, over it. And so for that uh, reason, um, the URL get method is used in most modern implementations as the way that you communicate information from the client to the server that you want the server to store or upload. And the reason why it's done is that it gives the server an opportunity to check it uh, before it does something with it much more easily. And so this URL method, it piggybacks on the HTTP GET, but what it does is it um, appends a suffix to the URL. And that suffix for the URL has a set of name value pairs. So for example, uh, you have here the name of the website, right? Uh, then you have some directory structure, and typically that directory structure encodes a method, right? Something you want the server to do. And then you have a bunch of name value pairs after that question mark. And so it takes all of these things and it says, ah, perform this method called animal search, and here's a name and here's a value, for example. Uh, this is used often with web forms, 
or something like this is used with web forms. Also, if you've seen RESTful SOA, uh, a represents, representation state transfer software-oriented architectures, they use a similar thing, uh, piggybacking on HTTP with these URL suffixes as a way to communicate um, a method uh, and the parameters you call that method with. And when the server gets this, it says, aha, um, given this port number, I know this is a RESTful SOA call, uh, so I'm going to instantiate a server-side method, and I'm going to call it with these parameters after doing some checking. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay. So this is uh, the set of uh, methods in a nutshell, uh, illustrating the difference between HTTP uh, version 1.0 and HTTP uh, version 1.1. Now, 1.0 is pretty simple, it does the job. Uh, there's get in the post, get is to retrieve, and you can use the URL suffix uh, to uh, send information, like from fields and things like that, and web forms uh, from the client to the server. You have the post, which is not used very often. Uh, and in fact, if you issue a post message and send it to a web server, oftentimes uh, folks who set up and install these web servers will turn off uh, that particular method, and it'll say something to the effect of this operation is not supported. Right. Um, then there's also head. Head is like a get, uh, but head says um, leave out the actual bits of the object. Just send me back the response line and the header lines because that's all that's important to me. And something like this is used uh, for caching, which we'll talk about hopefully either today or certainly uh, by Thursday. In HTTP 1.1, they added a few more methods. There's a put um, and there's also a delete. Now, of course, this delete can be very, very uh, dangerous because uh, someone could end up deleting a uh, part of an important website. And you can imagine deleting something and then reinserting something of your own uh, to take over a website, for example. Okay. So this is a response message. And the response message, as I said, is the message that's returned by the server uh, back across the wire uh, to the client. And so this response message, it is in clear text, uh, and it consists of a status line, and that's the server communicating to the client what the response was for this requested uh, message or for this request. And so the response could be either that everything went fine or there was a problem in some way or another, right? And so in this particular case, it's response 200, which is okay. So the server says, all right, well, I'm using HTTP 1.1, that's what I support. Uh, and the, it's a 200 as a status code, and then it has a descriptive message saying everything was okay. So you've probably seen error 404, which is uh, file not found, right? The resource that you requested does not exist, and so it's telling you, bless you, uh, that it did not exist, not found. And so the server must return back a response to the client, and this is this uh, status line is the server telling you uh, what happened as a result of what you asked it to do. Now, the server also supports these header lines, and it's things like the last time this file was modified, uh, the type of web server it's running, Apache 2.0 and, and uh, family, uh, the operating system it's running on. So it's on CentOS, which is a variant of uh, the open source version of Red Hat Linux, or the non-pay version of Red Hat Linux server running Apache on that particular platform, um, and content length, how big it was, and all sorts of other uh, pieces of information, whether it's a persistent connection and so forth. Right? I refer you to the RFC for HTTP 1.0, 1.1 rather, if you want to see what the different header line entries are. And then lastly, the last field after the header lines in the server response is the actual data. And this is where uh, the web page uh, HTML would be if you requested a web uh, page or an HTML document or PHP uh, from the server. Okay, and we'll take a look at that uh, in real time. All right, any questions about this? Does that make sense? Yeah, all right. So these are the different status codes. Now the status codes have numbers, but also descriptive uh, text that comes along with the response from the server. So error 404, not found. And I'll show you a version of that. 200 is okay. Typically when you get okay, you just get the web page, right? Uh, but when you get error 404, some websites or some web servers will return back a special page. Oops, uh, what you asked is not there. Um, or it'll just do the default and say error 404. And we can take a look at an example of that as well as some other status code messages. Okay, so what I'll do is use a program called Telnet. And Telnet is a TCP program. 
it allows you to initiate a TCP connection and actually type in text at the uh, command line uh, to mimic what some browser might send uh, to uh, a website. Okay, so let me um, pop out of here and let me bring up uh, Safari. And the first thing I'll do is I'll go to the university website, desu.edu, um, and I'll um, specify, I don't know, hello dot html right and so i don't think hello html exists but i'll try it and show you page not found right so that's fairly sophisticated it's showing you a page not found but let's go to um i don't know disney.com um and let's just say desu dot html and see what it displays when you can't find something 404 right and so in this particular case disney.com <laughs> That's funny. Um, Disney.com, because they're Disney, they have to make it, you know, extra. But um, they display error uh, 404 or some version of an error 404 page, which is to show you that that's the status code uh, coming back from the server. Although they make it really cute by having, you know, a Disney-esque type of uh, version of that web page. Okay. So let's go to gaia.cs.umass.edu. I'm going to do that in the browser. And this is the web page uh, for the computer, bless you. Uh, this is the web page for the Computer Networks Research Group, which is headed by Jim Carosa, the author of the book uh, at UMass Amherst. And so, you know, you can go uh, in Safari, and if you go to Preferences, I don't know what it is on Microsoft Windows, but on Mac OS, um, you can uh, turn on the developer uh, menu choice in your web browser uh, by going to your um, uh, settings and going to advanced and it'll say turn on develop menu or something like that and one thing you can do is say show the page source and what show the page source does <clears throat> excuse me my voice is cracking what show the page source does uh is shows you the actual html for that web page that was returned to the client i.e my browser uh from the server gaia.cs.umass.edu right and so you know computer network research group umass amherst um let me see if I can find some, uh, there's some GIFs, and I don't know if the modern CSS. Um, there's some text, the Computer Networks Research Group in the School of Computer Information Sciences, Computer Networks Research Group in the School of Computer Information Sciences, and of course, um, hyperlink text for the uh, School of Information and Computer Sciences enveloped inside of um, that um, href. Here, so when you click on it, it brings you to the main uh, college uh, website for the division. But this is the HTML uh, for the web page uh, that we're seeing here uh, in Safari. And most browsers, um, I can't really speak for what is it now? And uh, it's not Internet Explorer, and Microsoft Windows. There's a new name for the newest. One. Pardon? Edge, Microsoft Edge. Um, that. All right. So now I forgot where I was. Um, Microsoft Edge, thank you. And so most browsers um, support uh, the ability to view the page source. And you know, if you use webmail and you get a suspicious email, uh, don't open it. You can certainly navigate to it and view the web page source before clicking on links in an email and actually see uh, what those links uh, point to. Just because you see a link in an email, uh, make sure it is what you think it is. And so you can easily do that with most browsers. I'm sure Edge supports it. Uh, certainly Safari supports it and um, all the open source Chrome, um, now Google's Chrome and Firefox also support it. Um, so that's what the web page looks like in terms of its source. Let's try this out uh, using Telnet. Uh, so uh, let me bring up a window. And if you're on Mac OS, for the newest version of Mac OS, um, you're gonna have to install something called Brew uh, in order to download some of these basic tools because they don't want you to use Telnet, they want you to use Secure Shell. Uh, but if you Google search it, there are a bunch of commands already that you can consult that'll show you how to install Brew. Uh, so which Telnet, which Telnet, there we go. So I have Telnet installed. So I'll say Telnet Gaia, Dot, dot cs dot umass dot edu and I'm going to tell it to connect to port 80. So I connect to port 80 
and I successfully connected, and it says the escape character is, and it has that um, hat, carrot, and the um, square brace. Now, of course, this is a basic TCP connection uh, on port 80, and so the web server uh, on Gaia.cs.umass.edu is now waiting for me to send it input, right? When I said Telnet, and it gave the host name, and I gave the port number, that initiated the connection, and now it's waiting for me, the client, to send it data. So I'm going to send it uh, an HTTP GET request. So GET is the method. The resource is Corosa Ross uh, Interactive. Oops, Interactive Index.php version HTTP 1.1. Now I need a carriage return line feed, and this is where it gets a little confusing. When I hit ret oh man, I was too slow. All right, let me not talk so much, and let me hurry up and just do it faster. Um, it had a timeout, and of course it closed the connection because it was idle. Um, and so on the terminal, if you want to send character return line feed, you hit the return key, right? If you're doing it textually in an application, you're actually going to send backslash r backslash n. So let me just do this faster. I can't multitask, so I'm going to go quiet for a second. Corosa Ross Interactive. Character return line feed, character return line feed. Oh, come on. Uh, did I, what did I do? Um, all right, malform, not found. Index.php, interactive, did I misspell it? Oh, it's two S's. Oh, darn it. All right. All right, ready? Let me do this fast. All right. Uh, get Corosa Ross. There we go. All right. And so what I got back was the actual HTML, the same HTML, uh, or PHP, I should say, that you saw when I did the developer view uh, in the website. And so I could literally um, copy and paste all this that I got back, save it as a file, and display it in my browser, and it looked just like the web page, minus the, um, the, the graphics, because it requires a subsequent uh, HTTP get. Okay. Does that make sense? And so there's nothing different. Uh, from what the browser does when I use Telnet, only Telnet is very, very low level and you have to actually type the protocol bits yourself. And you could certainly, each of you, uh, write uh, a program in Python or Java or what have you to actually send uh, this uh, request uh, to the server yourself and then wait back for the response. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Let me check for time. <coughs> 54. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's pop back in uh, to PowerPoint, and that's an example of actually looking at the interaction, uh, and that is in clear text. And so what SSL does is encrypts that information uh, before it makes its way out onto the web. Now, you could have intercepted that with um, Wireshark and actually seen what's trafficking back and forth between my browser and the website, uh, the web server uh, at UMass. Okay, and so... Many of you uh, have often, uh, you know, done shopping online. Amazon wouldn't be a multi-billion dollar company if people uh, didn't use it to buy all sorts of things. And so typically, you know, you go to something like Amazon. Let me get rid of that uh, page source, developer view, Amazon.com. And let's say I wanted to go shopping. And maybe somebody could just shout out a product like, a, like what? What do I want to shop for? Uh, Echo? Okay, Echo. So an Echo. All right, so I click on, uh, I type Amazon Echo, and I have Echo Dots. We have all sorts of stuff, uh, refurbished Echo, all new Echo. All right, so let's click on that. So I click on the all new Echo, right? Hmm, all right, $74.99, although, you know, you can wait certain times, and it will come down to price, and all sorts of devices are connected, and that's wonderful. So let me kill that browser, and let me create a new window. And when I go back to Amazon.com, wait a minute, items you viewed, it remembered that, and it also recommends some items related to what I've searched for. How in the world did it do that? 
Well, it did that using something called cookies. Um, let's go into the browser history and kind of close the loop on this example. And let me go to Safari preferences and you go to privacy, manage website data. Hmm, website data. If I look at Amazon, right, you notice all sorts of stuff related to Amazon has been saved here, my website data. So I'm going to go to this Amazon.com entry and you'll see it says cache cookies local storage. Now, you've seen this when you did the Wireshark assignment. You said, gosh, well, uh, I went to the website and I can't find the HTTP GET message. And my response would be, have you visited that website before? Yes, yes, I have. Well, one of the things the browser is doing is it's saving information for you to be helpful, right? Uh, because you have all this rich content and these images uh, take a lot more time uh, to be transferred from the server back to the client, well, it saves this thing locally or caches it. And then any subsequent visit to that website, if it can, as much as possible, it tries to load it from its local copy on your hard drive because it doesn't have to pay that cost in terms of time to reach out across the internet and reload it down across uh, from the server, which an HTTP GET. So one of the pieces of information, not only the content, uh, is the cache. And so if I remove this entry, I'm removing that information associated with Amazon, the cookies in particular, and let me kill my browser, go back, new window, and go back to Amazon. If I go back to Amazon, you'll notice those recommendations and that memory of what I did before is gone, right? Uh, and so let's talk about what these cookies are. These cookies are the way that HTTP implements something called statefulness. Now we said that HTTP was stateless, meaning that the server doesn't remember anything about your connection. But by including a very specific piece of information among the header lines, right? This information comes from the local hard drive of uh, both the server as well as the client. It can implement something that looks a lot like statefulness. So what is a cookie? It's a special header line and it comes back initially in the response from the server back to the client. And so anytime you make a subsequent request, you're gonna to go to amazon.com. It says, aha, you're going to amazon.com. Well, last time you went to amazon.com, I got this piece of information in the cookie header line, and I'm gonna include that uh, in the header line of subsequent visits to amazon.com. So the cookie file is kept in a file called cookie.txt, and it's probably changed on modern browser implementations, uh, but that's what you're deleting when you remove this, right? And that's a privacy issue, because the moment somebody has access to your machine, both through a connection request or a response back, or when you furnish uh, some HTT, uh, the cookie header line in some HTTP request, someone intercepts it using Wireshark, now they can pretend to be you, furnish that cookie entry in a header line, and now they'll see what your browsing history was and figure out stuff about you. And so this cookie file is kept on your hard drive by your browser. And the server, when it sees this cookie entry, it's just a number, um, it looks up an entry in a database that's stored. And so while it doesn't know who you are, it creates a unique number, sends it to your browser, and your browser stores it locally. Subsequent visits, your browser furnishes this unique number. And so now Amazon says, ha, huh, well, let me look up uh, the database entry corresponding to this unique number. And now I know what you've browsed. I know what you've searched for. And now we can recommend stuff. Now, this is useful for certain applications like recommendations, uh, like browsing history, uh, like shopping carts and things like that. Um, but it can also um, allow someone to understand a lot more about your personal web behavior, right? Um, so you ever go to a website, you log in, you start browsing stuff and something, you shop, you say add to cart, and then you go away and then bring it back. It remembers what you purchased. Your shopping cart is still full. That's because the cookie was consulted and looked up information in the database for that merchant and then brought back up the shopping cart information. Okay. So let's take a look at how uh, these cookies uh, work. Uh, let's say you know you are browsing the web and you have a server here, your client uh, has a cookie file, and let's say you make an HTTP request to Amazon, and it's the first time you access amazon.com. You do a search for Amazon Echo or some other such product. Uh, it's the first time your IP address and your session has connected, so it doesn't know really who you are. And this is, you haven't even logged in, right? 
uh, that was an important consideration. So then Amazon, for your connection, uh, when you made that request to connect, it also randomly created the number that's unique to your session, or unique to you, I should say. So that is called a cookie. And in addition to creating that cookie uh, number, uh, it also created an entry in a database. So you go ahead and you click, you search, and you browse and do all sorts of stuff. It's recording that information associated with your cookie number uh, in its database. So now when the response comes back from Amazon's web server, and that's the content uh, as a result from your search, uh, it says set cookie in the header lines in the um, HTTP response from the server uh, back to the client. So now your browser gets the set cookie uh, header line entry, and it says, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and store in my file system Amazon.com so I know which website and that cookie number, in this case, 1678. So then it doesn't matter if you go back to Amazon.com now or some weeks later, you revisit Amazon.com and your browser merrily inserts this cookie header line entry um, on, the get, on the subsequent get request. So now Amazon gets this get request and says, ah, the cookie entry is set. What's the cookie number, 1678? I have an entry for that. Let me pull up this information and now pull up related stuff to what you've done or some other analysis, right? And so that's how these websites um, garner uh, what your uh, identity is, or at least your behavior. It can uniquely identify a series of actions on the website to a particular user. Now, of course, the usual response goes back and you could go come back three weeks later, one week later, some period of time later, that cookie file is still uh, on your hard drive um, underneath your browser. So you start your browser, you go back to amazon.com, that cookie header line is inserted with the cookie number. Amazon says, hey, welcome back. Um, some new stuff you might like. It displays that and the response goes back. So typically, if you are concerned about your browsing um, uh, behavior being recorded, there are so-called privacy browsers, right? Firefox Focus is one of them, there are others. You can also, in many browsers, say, uh, run it in private mode. And what it does is when the browser is exited, it throws away all that information, right? Um, some websites, if you turn off the ability uh, for using cookies with your web browser, some of them will give you a warning and say, you can get the best experience if you turn on the ability to have cookies in your web in your browser, right? That's because they want to be able to send this information back and forth. And some browsers won't let you, some, some websites rather won't let you. Um, some will give you the alternative, but say, hey, you won't get the best experience, but it's really up to you uh, what you choose to do. Now, are cookies harmful? Mm, it's just a matter of perspective, right? Uh, if you are concerned about your privacy, and you should be, especially as more and more of digital life uh, goes online, you should take your privacy seriously. And I'll just um, say it that way. Uh, so cookies is the way that you maintain something that looks like state uh, in a stateless system by storing this information at the endpoints. Uh, it's not explicitly maintained, uh, but you can certainly wipe this away uh, by removing those cookie entries in the privacy section of your browser settings. So what can cookies be used for? For authorization, for shopping carts to do recommendations, a way of remembering state. Uh, and so the interesting part about this, HTTP itself is stateless, but by maintaining state at the endpoints, both at the browser and at the server, uh, you can effectively implement what looks like state. It remembers something about your session, you uniquely, even if it doesn't know you specifically. It knows that this number associated with this browser um, is responsible for a certain set of clicks and searches and things like that uh, on a website. And so by keeping complexity at the endpoints, you can certainly get the same effect of implementing state in the case of cookies uh, while not putting that burden on any of the infrastructure uh, in the middle between these endpoints. And so it's the message that carries the state, but not particularly the applications that carry state. And so um, sites can learn a lot about you, both the sites you visit, as well as other sites um, that quote unquote partner with them, right? There's a new setting that was exposed, uh, made available in Facebook, uh, where they you can list all the third party uh, websites that collect information about you, right? And they're using, to a degree, uh, cookie information to do this. It's actually particularly surprising if you ever look at it. Just Google search it and 
click through and take a look and you'll be surprised. You should be surprised. Okay. Any questions about this? Make sense? Pardon? Um, I tend to like my privacy. I'm more on the um, obsessive side about it. Um, and especially, um, you know, because you're young, just starting out, just out of college, soon to be just out of college, um, you should be concerned about your privacy. Uh, you can imagine everything from planning a vacation to just social browsing to financial transactions to medical appointments. Um, imagine all that cookie information um, collected and then going forward as you get more and more devices that are online, imagine, you know, you have these smart locks. So now, you know, someone knows when you're opening and closing your locks on your house, when you're leaving the house, you know, when you're turning on the lights, if you have these uh, Wi-Fi uh, light bulbs, right? So, you know, over the next 10 years, um, you really need to take your privacy seriously because um, imagine, every, well, some people do it already. Imagine everything you do, you just broadcast out there, right? I'm, I personally have never understood the video, people who video log everything they do. Right. Um, there are certain things that you just want to keep private because you also don't understand over the near term to midterm what the implication of that could be. Right. So crime in the future is going to be very technical. It already is already is getting very technical. Um, and so each person has his or her own um, concept of why security is important. Um, I tend to be more on the obsessive side. Um, but you know, you might not be, but you should still be aware that people can figure out lots of things about you just based on your internet usage. And so, you know, it's often said in military environments, um, the presence of information is also information, right? So if I don't know what you're sending, but I do know at a certain time of day, you're connecting to a certain, uh, financial institution or website, I can tell something about you because of that, because people aren't random, right? You don't like randomly select something to do different times a day. People generally fall into habits. And so all I need is time and I can do it very cheaply with something like Wireshark. And so I think, and this is just my opinion, you should really take privacy seriously, particularly as more and more aspects um, of human existence goes online. Now, back in the old days, right? Um, old days, um, you know, when people mostly use cash and not cards for everything, or even now with mobile payments, you won't even use a card. You're going to like take your phone. That phone still has to connect to something, right? So if you go to Starbucks and you buy a coffee um, every morning on Friday um, with enough data, I'll know you go to Starbucks every morning on Friday. Or the people who check in to certain places on their website, why would you check in? Why would you tell people where you go and what you do at certain times of day, right? So especially because people are habit-based, um, if I knew that you checked in, I can, without too much effort, find out what your phone number is, right? And given your phone number, I could scam you and say, hey, um, we know, you know this is Starbucks representative and we're calling you about you know, blah, blah, blah. And I can get you to give me some banking information. Maybe not you because you're fairly sophisticated or maybe none of you, but all I need is one person uh, to, to give me that information. And so not only just in terms of the data itself, but just even the presence of information gives me enough to have a well-crafted phishing scam um, that I can get you to fall for, right? All it would take is a nice email, right? Um, I get these reset requests all the time. Your bank reset request, and I don't click on it. I go to my bank, and that's why they have these private inboxes, so you can verify if the bank actually sent you a piece of, uh, an email or if it was somebody trying to scam you. So it's real, um, and you should be concerned. Don't be afraid of it, but you know, exercise your judgment. Anything that you wouldn't like, say in a public room of people you don't know or people you do know, um, you shouldn't. You should be kind of. You should exercise privacy as as far as is concerned for your uh, internet practices. Okay, so it's a long-winded answer for um, take it seriously. Um, some people take it less seriously than others, um, but it's still important, even if they don't get the data, just by looking at your habits, uh, you can open yourself up uh, to all sorts of uh, phishing scams and things like that. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? All right, so with that, um, it is now 1.11. Um, I think I'll stop here uh, since proxies kind of is a precursor for caching, and this is a good stopping point. Uh, so we'll stop a little bit early. 
and uh, pick up uh, with the balance of uh, probably caching and hopefully get through the rest of uh, chapter two on Thursday. Um, so please look out uh, for the HTTP uh, assignment. Uh, it is always a favorite uh, of a lot of students um, and it is posted. Uh, please make sure you look at it sooner rather than later. And I'll see you all on Thursday.